Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading again, as, as I said, verse number 3 through verse number 8. The Bible says, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. <clears throat> and Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstling of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Turn to somebody, a real life person. Do not turn to a mystical, invisible figment of your imagination. Please turn and let them know not to let, tell them don't let your wounds get infected. Now turn to the other person who didn't hear that message and tell them don't let your wounds get infected. You know, I can see you, don't you? I can see you. Some of you did not turn to anybody. Where's security? <laughs> I remember when I was uh, just a boy, um, um, back coming up as a boy, back in, I'm not going to tell you the year, but uh, would come home from school and, and mama wouldn't let me play in school clothes. I, I don't know what parents do now, but when you got out of school, my mom would my mom would say, boy, get out of those clothes and change your clothes to play. And more, more than likely it was because I would have to wear the same clothes the next day, right? She didn't want me scuffing up. I, I remember this one particular time. Uh, I used to ask my mom, mama, can I take my bike? And of course, you know, my dad was working at that time, had not got, uh, didn't come home yet before he was retired. And I'd go outside and take my bike. Love taking my bike. It was, uh, my bike got stolen and returned so many times. <laughs> you know, when you live in the community and the, and, and the bully that steals your bike lives two apartment buildings, two project buildings down, you know, you kind of see it again. You tell your big brother, he gets it back. Then you see him again, he steals it back. That's funny. Okay. Well, uh, I remember this one particular time I fell off, off of my bike and, uh, I'm, 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 I have hemophobia, uh, still do to an extent where I'm a little nervous. A phobia is a fear of blood, particularly my own blood. <laughs> I don't like to see it. You know, I don't, not yours either, but I don't like to see it. I fell. And right now, to this day, I have a scar. When I fell off my bike, I, I fell on some glass, and it cut me. And it, this little scar right here, you see it? Okay, you're a witness. You see that? All right. So this scar happened. This wound happened. I'm bleeding, and I'm going crazy. It's the end of the world. Oh my God! Blood everywhere. I'm telling you, it's. Li I'm looking around. I'm starting to hyperventilate. Oh my God! I'm going to die. I'm going to die. So much blood. Oh Lord. Oh my God! I get inside the house. And my mama said, let's get this, this thing cleaned up. And looking back now, I realized there was something that she was addressing that was deeper than the wound. I mean, she didn't get frantic. She didn't panic because of all of the blood. I'm thinking that's the worst part of it. I'm thinking, oh, no, just make the blood go away. Make the blood stop. Oh, I'm bleeding. Oh, my, it looks like a hard move. Oh, my goodness. I'm oh, man, am I going to die, mom? Am I going to die, mom? Am I going to die? And uh, her main concern was let's get this thing cleaned up. We got to get it cleaned up. Because the reality is, 
while the wound can be hideous and the wound can be gory and the wound can be bloody and the wound can look really bad, there is something that's potentially worse than the wound itself. And the reason why mama said let's get this thing cleaned up is because beyond the wound is something that can make the wound bigger and more problematic. And what can make the wound bigger and more problematic is if the wound gets infected. It's possible for the bleeding to stop and it not to look as bad but to be worse if infection sets in. So I looked and seen what is the process of infection? What happens in infection? Well, first there's the pain. God wired us. He created us with nerve endings to be able to know that we're hurt. And it sends signals to our brain. Hey, something happened. Something happened. And you look, you feel the pain, you look, and there's the pain of the wound. But then what eventually starts happening is inflammation. It gets inflamed. In other words, there's that that hot feeling. And what's happening is the body is fighting within itself. Whatever happened outside of it has already happened. Now your body has gone into war mode. You become a walking civil war. Now even though nobody's fighting you on the outside, you're not swinging your arms, you're not dodging and weaving and ducking and jabbing, there's a fight on the inside. And your body now is doing everything it can so that this wound will not receive an intruder of bacteria. So it gets inflamed and the body, it it, it starts hurting and it starts vibrating. Uh, uh, You know, you can feel it. It's it's almost like pulsating. You can feel uh, the heat of the inflammation. And then it swells. And this is what happens a lot of times when infection sets in. It swells and, and the body's still fighting, but apparently something's going on with it and it starts swelling. And then after a while, it starts draining and leaking something, uh, uh, leaking fluid. Uh, and, and then you get tired or you get feverish because what's happened now is that the wound has received something that makes it no longer about the wound but the infection. Now, uh, I'm a diabetic, and of course, Brother Kendrick is too. And with diabetics, they tell us diabetics, be careful with your feet. There's a thing called diabetic neuropathy, and what that is is when there's not enough blood getting to your lower extremities. And so what they tell diabetics is you need to protect your feet. Protect it from a wound. And then if you happen to get a wound, they say you really need to protect it. Because now the wound opens the door for another problem. The wound opens the door for infection. So you have to protect it from infection. And even if the wound looks insignificant, the wound has great deadly potential because the wound can get infected. Or the wound is an invitation to something worse. Yeah, I'm not seeing where I'm going yet, but yeah, I'm building my case. I promise you I'm building my case. I said the wound is an invitation to something worse. And when somebody's wound gets infected, we often give more credit to the wound than the, than the wound deserves. But if somebody gets, if somebody has, if somebody has to get, uh, and, and, and I asked him if I can deal with that, he had an amputation. The problem was not the wound itself. The problem is what the wound invited to come in. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So, so if, if you get a scar and that scar gets gangrenous and it starts oozing, don't, watch this, we, are, we naturally say, what's going on? I got this wound, but the problem is no longer the wound. It's what the wound invited in. It's what the wound opened itself to. It's what the wound received. It's how the wound transitioned from being an outside problem to an internal problem. In our particular text, Genesis chapter 4, the Bible says that uh, this is the recording of the first 
homicide in history. And what happened was there was Cain and there was Abel after Adam and Eve knew each other in a sexual way. The Bible says there was Cain and Abel and the Bible says they go present themselves, their sacrifices to the Lord. The Bible says Cain gives an offering from the first fruit of his crop. Abel gives the best and the firstling of his flock. Now, now it doesn't say first fruit of his crop. It says from his crop. So here Abel is, he gives the best to God. Cain just gives to God some of his crop. Well, I want you to look at something here as we move through here. I want you to see the wound emotionally that Cain sustained. It was the wound of rejection. Turn to somebody and say the wound of rejection. Genesis chapter 4, verse number 5, the first part of the verse says what? And for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering. He had no regard. God had no regard. In other words, Abel brought his offering and God received it through the fire, the Shekinah glorified fire of God. Burns up Abel's offering. Cain brings his offering and God has no regard for Cain's offering rather. Cain's offering, right? So here he is. He's feeling some kind of way. His spirit is wounded. He's emotionally affected. He's feeling rejected. And he's not just feeling rejected, but he was rejected. Now let me first of all tell you that the wound itself is not fatal. The wound itself is not sinful. There's nothing wrong with Cain feeling rejected. There's nothing wrong with feeling rejected or turned down or feeling some kind of way because God did not accept you. A lot of times in church, we, we think that the problem is the feeling. But I'm here to tell you that feelings are not sin. There's nothing at all wrong with Cain and how he feels right now. He's feeling rejected. He watches his brother's sacrifice received up to the Lord. And here it is. The wound happens. He has this open wound emotionally where he feels rejected. The Bible says, verse 5, continue to read verse 5, part B. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. So watch this. You have... The wound, and then you have the emotional response. He's angry. There's nothing wrong with being angry. I don't care who you are in here, at some point you've been angry. I don't care who you are or how together you think you got it. At some point you felt rejected in your life. Say amen if you've ever felt rejected. Maybe, maybe, maybe you, you, you asked the young lady, uh, you know, can we become an item? And she said, well, no. She rejected you. And when you get rejected, guess how you feel? You feel rejected. Nothing wrong with the feeling of rejection. Nothing wrong with being angry. In church, we get sanctimonious and pious sometimes, and we treat anger like it's sin. That's why if some of you saw me get angry at somebody, if I got angry at Chris, and I said, man, I'm mad at you. Some of you will think I've lost my mind. He need to fill out a card. (laughs) Only in the church building. Anger is not a sin. God wired us that way. The Bible never says anger is a sin, but yet the Bible tells us to put it away. Now it does say be angry and sin not. But then the Bible also says put anger away. Why is it that anger, though not a sin, is encouraged to be put away? Because wounds, if they're left open long enough, can get infected. So what the Bible is basically saying is deal immediately with the thing that causes you 
to be in a posture to invite something else that may be sin. Are you understanding this? Well, we have the emotion in part B of verse number five. But look at the prevention. Look at verse number seven. What does the Bible say? If you do well. Watch this. God not- says, why are you angry? Why is your, content- why is your face like that? Why is your face looking like that? Macmillan? Why, why are you angry? Why is your countenance falling? God, here's, here's the prevention. Here's how the wound can be treated. He says, if you what? If you do well. If you do well. Will not your countenance be lifted up? Wouldn't, your, wouldn't everything be all right? Here's how you prevent infection. Give me what I want. What God did not do was change what he wanted because Cain felt wounded. He did not say, okay, Cain, I'll take that, even though it wasn't the first of your, of your, of your crop, even though you just gave it, even though there was no faith associated with it, I see you're upset, I'll take it. No. Rejection is a reality. And if rejection is a reality, feeling rejected is a reality. God did not say, oh, let me accommodate you. He says, now, this is how you can stop this thing. If you give me what I want, if your sacrifice was pleasing, wouldn't everything be all right? But look what he says in in the next part of the verse, read. And if you do not do well. If you don't do well, Cain. Sin is probably. Wait a minute, Cain. You're angry. You feel rejected. You feel like daddy treated younger brother better than older brother. You feel like you, they were favorites. You feel some kind of way because I accepted your brother and his sacrifice and I didn't accept yours. You're carrying some kind of feeling. You are in your feelings. I get it. Yes, you feel rejected. I get it. You're angry. I get it. You feel rejected. I get it. Your face is showing your feeling. You, you feel wounded. I get it. But he says, if you don't hurry up and treat this wound, sin, the infection of sin is lying at your door, crouching like a tiger, sin like a bacteria floating in the environment, waiting for an open wound, waiting for a wounded, a person's wound, waiting for the, the, waiting for the openness of the epidermis and the, the skin to be open so that the bacteria can land in the wound and begin to replicate. He says, dress this thing. Don't dress it simply, but address it by giving me what I want. But if you choose not to, king, sin is at the door. And sin is going to pounce on you at the door. Well, let's watch what happened when the infection flourished. Verse number eight. Cain told Abel, his brother, now, this is, this is a little part we, over, we overlook. See, when you get infected, one of the things that happens is you start losing control. See, as long as the wound is external, you have a certain amount of control. When that wound gets infected, it starts operating in you and controlling you. This is, you know, I remember when I got, when I took ill and my catheter got infected when I was on dialysis. And uh, of course, as long as I was dressing it and taking care of it, everything was all right. Well, it came out one day, went to the doctor, emergency room, and the emergency room doctor probably, I don't know if he didn't care or didn't know. I don't know if it was ignorance or rebellion. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But he pushed that thing right back in without gloves. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, when I go to dialysis, every, I, I look like E.T. Everything is, everything is sterile. And they're walking around with masks. And every, it, it looks like a hazardous zone. But you, you take your bare hands, you stick it in there. And, of course, that was what I thought, but that was what Sister Hamilton verbalized. Well, it wasn't but three days. 
And suddenly, what I was able to tend to on the outside no longer was localized to the outside. And it had got inside and it was replicating and my blood was infected. And here it was in the middle of July and I'm outside with a blanket on trying to control an external feeling that came and is coming from an internal problem. Because when you get, em- when you, when the wounds of your emotion get infected, they eventually cause you to lose control. They eventually cause you to not be able to just simply let it go. They usually cause you to be, to not be in a position where it can be treated with just praying. That's why some of you can worship and still wonder why can you do the same, the things, some of the things you do. Why is it that you can t- hear a sermon about love yet still hold a grudge from somebody? Because it's not just It it is not just cutaneous, it's subcutaneous. So the, the question is, since we can be emotionally wounded, not is it wrong to be angry, but now that you are angry, what now? Not... Uh, not, you know, uh, you know, not do you feel, not, not do you feel sad, but now that you are wounded and you feel sad, what now? Okay, I get it. You, you feel a feeling of attraction to somebody you shouldn't be attracted to. Is there anything wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing wrong. It's a feeling. Y'all getting, y'all looking crazy at me. Somebody said, yeah, there's something wrong with that. Oh, really? So while you sitting at home on the couch watching Idris elbows, are you in sin because you think he's attractive? Let's stop being so pious in the church building. Feelings aren't wrong. You're wired that way. That's why when you get to a certain age, young people, you don't want to play tag anymore. The young lady you play tag with, you're looking at now like, hmm, you are it. I need to encourage you that the sin is not in the feeling. Not that there, that the sin, is, watch this. The question is, now that you feel attracted, what now? What now? Okay, okay, somebody did you wrong. You're hurt. Somebody betrayed you. You're hurt. You're angry. You're disappointed. I didn't deserve this. I didn't even do nothing to this person. I don't know why she's talking about me. I don't know why he's talking about me. I don't know why he would do me this way. I don't know why she would do me this way. Okay, I get it. You're angry. You're wounded. Your spirit is broken. You have a wounded spirit. You're emotionally wounded. I get it. The question is, what now? What now? What now? Now that you've been offended, what? What now? Now now that you found out your best friend is your worst enemy, what now? Now that you, now that you, the argument happened and and your spouse won the argument even though she wrong. (laughs) Or he wrong. What now? You, you, you wounded. You, you feel despised. You caught wind that somebody been talking about you. They've been posting about you. Put you on blast. On Facebook. You angry. I understand. No sin in being angry. No sin in feeling rejected. Maybe you, you come in and you do, you work ministry and you work ministry and you, you're here and you're faithful and you're on time and you're always here to lend a helping hand. You're always here and somebody, well, and somebody picks up a little piece of paper and they get recognized from the pulpit for picking up a little piece of paper and you done cleaned this whole sanctuary and you feel overlooked. You feel rejected. You feel dejected. I get that. 
But the question is, what now? If you are not careful to treat the wounds in your emotions, they will get you to a place where you will lose all sense of discernment. And it will look like you're acting out of character. But it's not that you're acting out of character. It's just you left something untreated and undealt with from two years ago. And it's finally made its way to the surface two years later. And now you're getting revenge on somebody for what they did two years ago. And you felt hurt and you felt offended. But instead of dealing with it, instead of addressing it, you let that thing get infected for two whole years. Two years later, you're acting crazy. Two years later, you're not speaking. Two years later, you're doing things that are spiteful and vengeful. And they're wondering what in the world is going on. What's going on is you didn't deal with it two years ago. Instead, you let it get infected. Now, two years later you're actually trying to hurt people who are helping you is there a witness in the house go to first Samuel oh God somebody's going to be blessed if you receive this you're going to be blessed because some of you are wondering, why did my, see, uh, see, and I've learned a lot of times when a person does something and you wonder why they do, why they do that. Sometimes people are not even responding to right now. People will hurt you today from a wound that they received 10 years ago. If you and I as Christians do not swiftly address the wound, if we don't hurry up and forgive, We will find ourselves operating in infection today by a wound that we incurred years ago. And this is why some of us never seem to feel like we're coming out of and being delivered. It's because you would have been delivered if you would have dealt with that wound and didn't let it fester and didn't let it get infected and didn't let it replicate. But no, you closed it up. Watch this. You covered it, but you didn't clean it. And whenever you cover a wound but don't clean it, you trap the infection in. And when you cover an emotional wound, when somebody offends you and you don't do it the Bible way, if your brother offends you, go to your brother. Otherwise, that thing will infect and you'll be enemies with somebody and they won't even know it. They would have moved on. They would, they would have begun thinking everything is okay. You look up one day and they're just treating you strange and they're treating you strange because they allowed an emotional wound to get infected. And some of us live in infection. And when you do that, you lose so much discernment that you will attack the very people who try to help you. Okay, go to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 17, how many of you are familiar with the story of David and Goliath? Okay, you know, they come back from the battle. Let's begin reading at verse number 6. And I'm going to share something about you, uh, share something with you. Uh, what does the Bible say? First hey. Samuel eighteen six. Read. And it came to pass. Came to pass as they came. Mm-hmm. When David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine. Read. That the woman came out of the cities of Israel, uh-huh. singing and dancing, uh-huh. to meet King Saul uh-huh. with tabrets. With joy, uh-huh. with instruments, uh-huh. of music. Read. And the woman answered one another, "What?" As they played, uh-huh. and said, "Saul." What was the remix? How about slain his thousands? Saul has killed his thousands. Saul has killed his thousands. Killed his thousands. He did. <laughs> Some of the young people know what I'm talking about. I just figured out what that song. Okay. Anyway, moving on. If you don't know what it is, God bless you. But then the song got remixed, and the remix sounded like this. What's the next part of the verse? And David, his ten thousands. Now it looks like David is being given credit 
as having killed ten thousands for one kill. But in chapter 17, he did kill Goliath. But verse number five says and indicates that there was a period of time between the time David killed Goliath and this moment. And in that period of time, apparently David fought some other wars and God was elevating David. Look at verse number five. 18.5, read. And David went to with over Saul, sent Uh him, and behaved himself wisely. David went out wherever Saul sent him. This is after Goliath. Now, I've I've got to show you something. Read. And what? And Saul set him over the man of war. What? Saul set him over what? The man of the men of war. So watch this. Between fighting Goliath and this point, David. Saul elevated him. And and I need to help you with this because some of you want to know why your elevator can turn into your hater in just a matter of moments. Elevators turn into haters in just a matter of moments when elevators get, get wounded and don't address the wound. So Saul... Gives David position after Goliath. They go out everywhere. Saul sends David out. David is going out and he prospers. He's fighting the Philistine. The nation. That word Philistine in verse number six is not talking about the giant. It's talking about the people. Like God says to Israel. He says Israel. He says Jacob. Now he's, the text is saying the Philistine. That's not talking about Goliath. This means between the time David killed Goliath and now David had fought some other wars. God was lifting him up. Saul elevated him, put him over his men of war. And then what happens? Read. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people. Everybody accepted him. Saul accepted him. Saul gave him a promotion. But look what happens. Read. And he also, in the sight of Saul's servants. Wait. And it came to pass. Came to pass. As they came. As they came. When David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines. What's happening? Then the woman came out of the cities of Israel. The women come out. Singing and dancing. Here's the song again. To meet King Saul. Has slain his thousands. David his ten thousands. Look at what happens. Watch the wound. Read. With tabrets. With joy and with instrument of music. Uh huh. Read. And the women answered one another as they played. Uh huh. And said, "Saul slain his thousands. Has slain a thousand. And David, David is ten thousand. thousand. Read. And Saul was very wroth. Oh, there it is. There's the emotion. Now, and what's what's the wound? The wound is feeling jealously underappreciated. That word jealous means zealous. It means zealous. It means passionate. It means a intensified emotion. He feels underappreciated. Is there anything wrong? Is there anything sinful with feeling like you're underappreciated? No. Everybody's been there. Everybody's been there. Everybody's been there when somebody special to you, when somebody that you, whose opinion you value, starts appreciating somebody else more than you, you feel underappreciated. That it is not a sin to feel underappreciated. That word jealous means to want what's yours. There's nothing wrong with wanting what's yours. Okay, has anyone ever heard somebody get the credit for something you did? I want to talk to your hearts today. Has anyone ever heard a compliment given to somebody else that should have been given to you? Has anyone ever told somebody else good job for the work you helped them to do? Come on, be real up in here. Y'all don't get quiet on me. I'm going to call for volunteers to explain your situation in a minute. (laughs) Underappreciated. My birthday came. You told everybody happy birthday on their birthday and looked at me and just gave me a hug. (laughs) Underappreciated. 
Has anyone on their job had to train the person that would soon be your boss? Underappreciated. Not a sin to feel underappreciated. Not a sin to be passionate about wanting what's due to you. But the question is, now what? Now that somebody else is being attributed with something that you feel should be attributed to you, now what? See, we got to stop calling the feeling sin. And the reason why we got to stop calling the feeling sin, because we'll, God wired us with emotion. And if you are underappreciated, why shouldn't you feel underappreciated? It is not a sin to feel rejected when you're rejected. It is not a sin to feel underappreciated when you're underappreciated. The question always remains, now that you feel that way, what now? Well, in this particular text, that wound also led not only to anger, but it aroused distrust. Look in verse Look in the verse number uh, nine. Y'all still with me? We almost done. Verse number nine says what? And Saul eyed David. And okay. Saul eyed David. Is there anything wrong with being distrustful? Is there anything wrong with not trusting people? Y'all better be honest up in this piece. Some of y'all right here got people right in this room that you don't trust. And you eye them. <laughs> See, I get to sit on the stage. And some of y'all worship like this. <laughs> and if the stars don't see. <laughs> That's real talk. Some of y'all do worship like that. Anyway. Nothing wrong with that. That's a wound. But look what happens if you do. Saul doesn't deal with it. And the wound begins to get infected and take over his character. Because unmanaged emotional wounds turn into character infections. Are y'all hearing me? Unmanaged. Emotional wounds will turn into a character infection to where you'll end up somebody you never thought you'd be because you did not address a feeling that was an emotional wound and you let it get infected. Okay, watch this. Verse number 10. And it came to pass... Here's the prevention. Watch this. David was not his enemy. Verse 10 says what? And it came to pass on the morrow. Came to pass on the morrow. That the evil spirit from God. The evil spirit of, from God. Came upon Saul. That word evil spirit. Uh, it's not talking about immoral. It's talking about deranged. Some other versions will say deranged. Uh, Brother Ralph, uh, we laughed about uh, what to call it because he's a counselor and a it's, it's, it's schizophrenic. It's paranoia. Paranoid schizophrenia. It's a, ment it's, a, it's a mental unrest. And he was already eyeing David. He already had some wounds. And if that wasn't enough, he had a mental illness. Now I need to tell you that it couldn't be blamed on the mental illness. Because he had this mental illness before. Go to chapter 16. And I'm going to show you what happens when wounds get infected. When wounds get infected, watch this. Any other thing that's there intensifies the infection. Watch verse number uh, 23 of chapter 16. What does the Bible say? And this is before Goliath. Well, ac actually, yes, verse number 23. What does the Bible say? So it came about whenever the evil spirit from God 
So there was a deranged spirit, a schizophrenic, paranoid spirit that would fall on Saul and it would make him uneasy and it would make him frantic and it would make him, uh, give him a state of unrest. And the Bible said, whenever that evil spirit, that deranged spirit came on Saul, what happened? David would take the harp and play it. David, watch this. David, the person he's now distrustful of, the person he's now eyeing, the person who now is the target, not the blame for, but the target of the wound he has on the inside. Before this happened in 18, David would come and do what? He would take the harp and play it with his hands. He would play the harp with his hands, read. And Saul would be refreshed and be well. Saul would be positively impacted by David. You get to chapter 18 after he's wounded and his wound gets infected emotionally. David does the same thing that he always does, but it has a different effect. Not because David is doing anything different, but because Saul has an emotional wound that has gotten infected. And when you get emotionally wounded, you will kill and attack those who aren't even your enemies. And what they would usually do to encourage you will be received adversely, not because they're your enemy, but because you're infected. Look at chapter 18. I'm going to show you this. So he would be refreshed. In other words, that paranoid spirit would be calmed when David would play play the harp and calm his spirit but if you look in verse number 10 of chapter 18 what does the bible say now it came about on the came next day came about on the next day that the evil spirit from evil god evil spirit from god came mightily upon came Saul came mightily upon Saul and he raved in the midst of the house he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand now watch this what what effect did this have before he got emotionally wounded and infected it calmed him down it calmed him down have you ever hugged somebody and at one point they say oh that thank you i needed that Watch this. You do something that you're unaware of or they become wounded because of your progress or your success or they become jealous or they feel like they are underappreciated because you got appreciated for something they felt they should have got appreciated for. You come and hug them like you usually do and the hug that they once responded to by saying I needed that now becomes something totally different not because you've done something different but because they have an emotional wound that they did not address and now they are infected with hateration. If you don't know or that never happened to you then maybe you're the other person. Look what happens. This time it didn't have that effect. Read. As usual. As usual. And a spear spear was in Saul's hand. But a spear was in his hand. Read. Saul hurled the spear for the thought. Uh Uh-huh. He thought what? I will pin David to the wall. I'm going to kill David. For what? Why are you killing David? What did David do to you? You promoted him. You put him in charge of your men of war. He's a success. And even though he's a success and the woman comes singing to you, it should be a compliment that you chose to promote the right man to benefit your military. But when you are emotionally wounded, you lose so much discernment that you can't tell the difference between your friends and your enemies. I'm talking to somebody in here, at least three of y'all. It's all on your face. So I want to give you some principles, about six of them. Ways you can deal with that. And if if we need to extend this to next week, we will. We probably will. Here's some principles. And if you're taking notes, take these notes down. The first one, pray to God candidly about how you feel. Everybody read that. Pray to God. Here's the thing. There are some things people are afraid to say to God. Like, I don't like, I don't like how this person 
got credit for something I did. We go to God, and church has kind of made us feel like we got to go to God in some sanctimonious King James way. So we come to God, and we expose it. We come to church, and we expose it. Father God, we come unto thee. Because thou art God, and beside thee there is none other. From ages to ages, you are God. Oh God, we come to thee because there is no other help we know. If you withdraw your hand from me, whither soever. You don't talk like that. Do you? You come home, you don't say, baby, whithersoever hast thou gone that thou mightest fetch me dinner. Be it unto thee to feed me. Blessed shalt thou be if thou feed me. No. And we get this false sense of how to talk to God. Be candid. And some people say, well, you don't want to tell God. You don't like, you, you know, you, you feel it up. Here's the problem. We transpose us on God. God already knows. So when you learn and believe he knows at that point, you can start telling him exactly how it is up here. It's not for his information. It's for your restoration. So learn to speak candidly to God about how you feel. Lord, I feel overlooked. I wrote Brother Jones' sermon and then he got up there and preached it and everybody said good sermon and he didn't even say it came from me. Matter of fact, he said, thank you. I work hard on it. <laughs> Lord, I don't think that's fair. That didn't happen for real. Please don't. That's a joke. That's a joke. Brother, Brother Jones uh, preaches Brother Thompson's sermon, not mine. <laughs> Point number two. Is this blessing anybody in here? I wanted to be practical this year. We could have went into the theological and dig. We did that last year. We went through all of systematic theology. But I wanted to give you something on how to live because some of you need this not just for your workplace. Some of you need this for your home, amen. for your relatives, for your coworkers. Oh, come on in this house. Say amen. amen. Second principle. Don't wait. For, why don't we put it up there? Everybody read it. Some of us feel like we can't forgive because we're still hurting. You can't depend on your feelings to change before you decide to forgive. When you do that, you leave the wound open. I'm still mad at you. You forgive me? No, I'm still mad at you. You got that thing confused. In a minute, what started out as purely anger is going to turn into vengeance. And now you have another problem. At first you were just angry. Now you want to get them back. And people will move on. But if you have not dealt with that emotion. And you are waiting for your feelings to change before you swiftly forgive. They will move on. The sun will be shining but there will be a thunderstorm in your heart. You will act out vengeance during one of the good seasons in Yao's life. And now you got to reap a bad crop in a good season because you did not deal with the wound in your emotion. Don't wait on your feelings. I know when someone hurts you, it hurts. It makes you angry. It makes you frustrated. They shouldn't have did that. How could you betray me like that? How could you lie on me like that? How could you tell my business like that? Okay, it hurts. Don't wait on your feelings. Because all the devil has to do is manipulate your feelings. And you'll be sitting there getting emotionally infected. And before long, you'll become a whole different person. And won't even know who you are anymore. Third principle. Next principle is, I want you, don't rehearse the occurrence. Everybody read that. Sometimes when you're hurt and when you have an emotion, when you're angry, you want to find other people that will co-sign yes, on your emotion. Yes, sir. If you're going to get better, 
you can't keep rehearsing the hurt. That's right. Amen. Wow. Even if it's even if you still feel it. The reason why you can't do that is because, and we're going to talk about this principle, healing has to happen. If you've ever had a scab, a, a wound, and you've treated it, it begins to scab over. And what that is, it's an indication that your body is winning. You're winning. You're winning. Watch this. It doesn't hurt as bad. It goes from hurting to itching. What used to hurt you before just itches now. There are some people you come around and get mad. Now you just get itchy. (laughs) I mean, you used to get mad when they come around. Now they come around and you just start, you know. Hey, how you? (laughs) Good to see you. And then don't put yourself around people who are going to help you rehearse the hurt. Because one thing we want when we're hurt or we feel rejected or we feel overlooked or we feel neglected or we feel offended is we want to be around other people that co-sign our feeling and other people will keep pulling the scab off with us. So there are some people you don't need to be around when you're trying to heal. There are some people you need to temporarily cut off from and you need to, you need to quarantine yourself away from because those people love you so much but they don't know how to love you. And they want to show they're on your side. They want to show I'm with you. They'll say, well, did you, did, what's, did you see what's the name? You wasn't thinking about what's the name. You're getting over what's the name. But they want to show you they down with you. Ride or die. So they bring up what's the name. And you keep that person, these people around, and the scab comes off. You see what's the name, and now you're hurting again and not itching anymore. Say amen if this is helping anybody. Next principle. Next principle is refocus. Everybody read it. Let's read it together. Whenever you get absorbed with your wounds, it's a setup for you to get absorbed with the emotions tied to them. So what you have to do is you have to refocus your attention from your wound onto your purpose. Yes, sir. There are some people who never heal because they spend so much time focusing on their wound. Amen. That's why I commend Kendrick. Can I, can I share this? Kendrick had his toe amputated. He said, oh, I've got to go in. Let me tell you what he did. He came up here. He, stand up, he stood up here. He said, brother, just pray for me. You know, I've got to go in to the doctor. And, and then he, I saw some posts. Oh, they got, to take, they got to take my toe. And there were people, oh, man, that's terrible. That's ter-. I saw the post. I said, oh, man, people, that's terrible. Kendrick said, I'll be all right. Next thing you know, you saw Kendrick up here. <laughs> singing his heart out. Yeah. He didn't spend his time being consumed with what he's missing. He spent his time focusing on what he was missing. You get that? Eclipse the pain with fulfillment and purpose. And the best way to do it is not to focus on your wound, but to focus on helping somebody so as to give your wound a chance to heal. Final one. Everybody read it. Healing can't be forced. There was this thing my mom used to do. Uh, uh, If you ever got burned on the stove or burned in any way, uh, been curious about a stove top. You put your hand there, or the fire's turned off, and you put your hand on it, and it hurts, right? 
And the thing about burns is they immediately go inward. Have you ever been burned before? The outside is cool, but you're still burning inside the womb. And so, uh, you know, you know, and I was telling 730 this, my dad, right? He thought, uh, he thought that there was, there was, that the answer to everything was peroxide. <laughs> Put some peroxide on it. <laughs> oh, your nose running? Drink some peroxide. Goggle with it. <laughs> you got a cold? But my mama used to use cocoa butter. And people still use that today. But before cocoa butter, if she didn't have any cocoa butter, you know what she would do? She would just get plain old butter. And she'd go in that little, in the refrigerator and she'd take butter and put it on there. Well, watch this. Uh, it was still hurting. Because sometimes healing is happening while the pain is still happening. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, sir. Don't, don't miss this. Healing is happening even though the pain is still going on. But because I wanted to hurry up the process, when she wasn't looking, I'd go in there and get the butter and I'd put, all, I'd put more on there. How many of you know putting more butter on it was not going to rush the healing process? You cannot rush healing. Are you understanding this? And don't let anybody else rush your healing sometimes the very people that hurt you get mad because you're not healing fast enough and they come to you with a hurry up and heal mentality I cannot hurry up and heal because healing is a process that cannot be coerced the only thing you can do with healing is position yourself for it now, it can't be hurried, but it can be hindered. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So as the wound heals and the Lord, the, one of the ways to do it is to surround yourself. Change what's going inside of you. Instead of listening to Chance the Rapper, take a break from Drake and listen to something about Jesus. Instead of reading those steamy books, open up your Bible on a day other than Sunday. Open up scriptures that minister to your soul and stop trying to minister to your body. The reality is you are not going to get healing from your, to your soul trying to minister to your flesh. Surround yourself with other people that like living in their healing. Yes, Amen. When you are in the process of healing and recovering from infection, you have to be in a sterile environment. There are some personalities that deal with you now that you are going to have to shed yourself of when you are healing. It's amazing how people are so selfish that they want to be all up in your face in the process of your healing. Hmm. Remember how you get there. And treat the wounds quickly. Somebody hurt you, the Bible gives the remedy. If your brother offends you, go to your brother. You may find out that he or she doesn't even know they did offend you. But what we do is we take the easy way out. I ain't saying nothing to her. I ain't ain't got two words for her. Yeah, you big and bad, but now you got an infection. Because she's going on. She's living. He's going on with his life. He's on to the next. And you're getting infected and becoming ugly and becoming, and, 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 and and you're draining. That's one of the processes of infection. You start draining. And everywhere you go, you talk about your problems. And let me tell you something. 
I'm fine. I'm a minister. I, I, I love ministering to people. I love, I love, you know, helping people. But I get tired of being around people who, when I see them, I know all they're going to talk about. Now I know I know initially when it first when you when your wound gets gets infected you want to talk about it I'm hurt this happened to me you won't believe this happened to me but after a while I seek for other doors of exit when I see you coming if all you got to do is talk about how wounded you are at some point you need to stop talking about it and focus on healing <laughs> Stand to your feet I want to pray for those of you who heard God's voice. If you heard God's voice today, come on down. I'm done. I've held you long enough. Give God some glory if you heard his voice. I didn't say my voice. I said his voice. And as you come down, keep in mind we're going to pray together.